rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand together as we open our service in song. I 
that's around become shadows in the light of you when I found the joy of reaching your heart when my will becomes enthralled in your when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you I worship you I worship you the reason I live is to Offering will be taken by the boxes at the end of each aisle at the close of the service. We'll be starting a small group in the next couple of weeks, and I wanted Chandler to tell you about it. Good morning. My name is Chandler Owens, and I'm the intern for Princeton Meadow Church throughout this year. If you haven't heard, I am excited to present a new opportunity for worship and learning that will start November 1st. I will be leading a new small group for members under 40 and around that age in an eight-week course studying all three epistles of John. The letters that John wrote are a great foundation for starting to learn more about what it means to live in relationship with Christ, as well as a deep theology for those wanting to learn more. We will meet Sunday afternoons at the church from 5.30 to 7 p.m., and pizza and drinks will be provided. In order to maintain current safety guidelines, social distancing and masks will be utilized so that everyone who wishes to attend may do so and feel safe while doing so. Because of this, and to maximize the effectiveness of the group dynamics, we will have a capacity of 12 members for the group. So if you are interested or would like more information, please contact me at chandler.owens at ptsim.edu. We will be sending out more information via mail to members who may be interested. Thank you for your time, and I hope to be hearing from you shortly. Peace be with you. God bless. So if you'd like to be part of this group, it's restricted to 12 attending. Uh, contact Chandler uh, or the church office. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, we've had a beautiful week. You've created the sunshine, the season. You've given us eyes to see, ears to hear. We're able to communicate with one another. And yet, we live in fear. As a culture, we're filled with anxiety. People are hidden in their homes. 
consumed with concern. And in the face of all of this, you have told us that we are new in Christ, that we are a new creation, that you transform our minds, that you've taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. We pray, Lord, for your church, that we would not be living in darkness, but instead we would live courageously, hopefully, filled with concern for others, filled with the understanding that you have equipped each of us with gifts, gifts of service to others. May we use those gifts now. We remember the high points of the Christian church when plague swept across Europe. It was Christians who were gathering bringing food and soup to those who were ill. It was Christians who went through the streets and picked up the bodies of those who were dead. Darkness. Someone would die in their home and they would just simply throw their body in the street. A world of ignorance. We live in that world today. We pray for courage. We pray for faith. We pray for eyes to see and ears to hear. We thank you that Christ restores our thinking, gives us wisdom, and as we seek first your kingdom, all of these other things will be granted to us. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been studying together the Beatitudes. Today we come to Matthew 5.5. 5. The beatitude, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now we have a problem right at the start on this verse. It has to do with definitions. It has to do with culture. In the American English culture, the word meek is not at the top of the list of qualities. As a matter of fact, the definition in Merriam-Webster, a meek person is defined as a mild person, deficient in courage, submissive, and weak. The words that we use to describe a meek person is spineless, no sense of purpose, no passion, a meek person, weak, indecisive. Another generation understood the term milk toast. Milk toast served during the Depression. No one had anything. And so what did you eat? You took a piece of white bread and soaked it in milk. It had no substance. It had really virtually no nutrition, but it kind of filled the stomach. A meek person, submissive, overly reflective, consumed with the concerns out there which prevent me from acting. 
Now, I say that this is a problem. In this beatitude, blessed are the meek. Who wants to be meek? No one. You'll never be promoted at work if you're meek with that definition. Uh, you will probably wind up with an over-controlling spouse if you have this type of meek personality. Well, what's interesting is we remember the scriptures as we read them uh, were spoken and written in Greek. This is one of those moments where it is important to get our definition correct. The word that is used in the Greek when Jesus spoke in this language that was understood, eventually Koine Greek, understood around the entire Roman Empire. One of the reasons that Paul could take the gospel in a common language and everyone understood what he was saying. It was the fullness of time. The word that is used by Jesus, blessed are the meek, is an exact Greek word. It's the word praus, P-R-A-U-S. There are many words describing various qualities of life. But when Jesus says, blessed are the praus, everyone understood. Because there was a cultural understanding of the word praus, the Greek. You see, when he said, blessed are the meek, the word that he uses is the highest virtuous value. And it was understood, that's something I want to be. I want to be meek. But unfortunately, over the centuries in English, the meaning has changed. So what did it mean when Jesus said, blessed are the meek? Well, there was a cultural world, just like there is today, virtues. Right now, today, the word virtue, what does it mean? Who's virtuous? How often do you run across someone that you say, they have virtue? What do we even mean by the word? What's happened today is a new phrase. It's called virtue signaling. What's virtue signaling? Well, we've divided into camps political camps, economic camps, ethnic camps, and each of those camps has values that they consider to be virtues. Now, the virtues in one camp, looting, are not the virtues in another camp. They're opposed to looting. What's virtue signaling? It's when you know someone in this camp or that camp, but you don't have the courage to stand with this camp or that camp. And so you virtually signal Sometimes it's with a wink. Sometimes it's a lawn sign. Sometimes it's a bumper sticker. Sometimes it's just silence. But we 
signal I'm with you. And we don't even have to say a word. That's how we understand virtue today. There is no universal sense of virtue. It's been segmented. And we signal. And we know how to signal. And so if you're in a lunchroom and someone starts talking one way or another, you know I'm going to be silent. Or I'm going to speak up. But it's not part of what you're doing. It's not part of your personality. It's something you just intellectually signal. That's it. Well, that is not the context in which Jesus said, blessed are the meek. No, the word meek had a very clear understanding. It was the understanding of the Greek culture, which surrounded philosophically, religiously, the world of Jesus. When he says, blessed are the meek, they understood that meekness is included as a virtue in the Greek philosophy. They understood particular virtues, prudence, temperance, courage, justice. When you ran across a person who was just, fair-minded, as we heard this week in the uh, investigation, the oversight of the new Supreme Court potential justice, people were taken by just simply uh, her presence, her response. Not angry, not sad, not depressed. Thought through issues. Everyone virtually said this is quite a candidate. Well, they understood uh, this is someone who is interested in justice, who shows mercy, who's a human being, intelligent, capable. In the Greek world, there were seven heavenly virtues, faith, hope, charity, fortitude, justice, prudence. Now what was unique though about those virtues, they were not a laundry list. They were all, as it were, one thing. If you're going to be a virtuous person, you perform all of those at the same time. Meaning what? There weren't many virtuous people around. Aristotle considered himself a virtuous man. Could point out a few others, but basically, we look at those virtues and we say, I may be this, but I'm not that. So I'm disqualified. When Jesus says, blessed are the meek, he is describing a virtue of the day that people understood as part of a bigger picture. These virtues were described as the center point of extremes. So who is a generous person? Well, a generous person is someone who doesn't spend everything on themselves, self-consumed, but it's also someone who in the excess, 
is not overly committed to all of their resources on themselves. They're neither a miser, nor are they extremely self-consumed. So what is a generous person? It's in the middle. And that's how they define a generous person. All of the virtues were defined by the extremes, but the center point. And so when Jesus said, blessed are the meek, what were the extremes? Why was that considered a virtue? Meekness is associated with a word that we never would consider, anger, anger. The meek person is not the person who is aggressively angry on the one hand, nor are they excessively passive. So what is a meek person? A meek person is in the center. They're angry at the right time. They are passive at the right time, a meek person, neither extreme. And so if you stop your car on Route 1 out of rage because of something that someone has cut you off, you are involved in the extreme. You're not a wise person. You're a fool. Don't get out of your car. Keep moving. Don't engage. But you see, that takes type of self-control. See, the fool is continually consumed on self. What are the right times and the wrong times to show anger? Well, it's a theme all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament. For example, in Proverbs 19.11, a man's discretion makes him slow to anger. It's his glory, what? To overlook a transgression. Now hold it, hold it. That guy cut me off. I got to teach him what's right. No, you're a fool. You're much better off just overlooking it and move on. This is what Jesus says in Luke 6, 27. I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Again, in Proverbs 12, 16, fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. C.S. Lewis understood this quite well. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. That we are not the number one priority in this world. And so humility is the ability to be angry 
at the right time. And to be passive at the right time. And so Jesus was angry when he entered the temple. And he overturns the tables of the money lenders. Why? It was the right time for him to be angry. He was being meek at that moment. And why was he silent before Pilate? Because he was passing a personal injury. It's not the time for me to be angry. I'll be silent. Now there is a second important dimension of being meek. It has to do with the ability that we see with animals, pets. I've got some neighbors who, as they, as you pass them and they're walking their dogs, they have all they can do to control that dog. <laughs> come on, come on. And try to get by. That is not a meek dog. That is not a dog that has been trained well. This word meek in the Greek has an additional dimension. It has to do with animals that have learned how to respond to the commands of their owner. To be a meek person, as it were to be a meek pet, is to respond to the reins, if you're a horse, to the bit that's in your mouth. We've all seen pictures of the Mustangs, the wild horses that are first broken. They're wild. They're out of control. They are not meek. Eventually, the cowboy will slow that horse down. Then he'll approach the horse gently, and he'll put a bit in its mouth. And then at another point, gently place a saddle blanket in a saddle. And then at another point, step up and be seated on the back of that horse. And what happens then? The horse starts bucking again until it learns how to have a rider and a horse and a saddle. Years ago, we were given a 27-year-old mare named Lady. Lady was from a line of quarter horses, going all the way back to the King family, the King Ranch. It was a purebred quarter horse. We didn't know it at the time. When we received for the first time from the trailer lady, we tentatively escorted her out of the trailer. As soon as she stepped on the ground, she reared up. She pulled the reins from our hands, ran down the street. You could see her a quarter of a mile away running with Tremendous speed and power. I said, how are we ever going to get this horse back? Someone found her, brought her back to us. A year later, we learned that mares can always uh, become pregnant. We bred Lady. My son Tom was in the stall when Sonny was born. Sonny, a beautiful Palomino. He spent the first year training Sonny. A perfect color, Palomino. We then had a friend who was a trainer 
began to train Sonny. We showed the horse throughout the Northeast. Sonny kept winning first place. It was so interesting, my goodness. It's not costing us anything for the stall. It's inexpensive. This is an expensive sport. And here we are, we've got a horse that's winning all of these competitions. And so we found a trainer. He began to show Tom how to work with the reins and the bit, how to control Sonny. He was two years old. He said, I think we can bring this horse to the world championship in Oklahoma City. Tom went with him. At the world championship is a category of Palomino two-year-old quarter horses. And here they are. They all line up. There's about 15, 20 of these horses from around the world, from around the country, being shown at the world championship. Do you know what it takes to train a horse to stand in a line like this with other horses? And then for them to break off, start circling around the corral in various shapes and movements so that the judges are able to compare. Sonny won in the category of halter, of lunge line, of color, received a world championship. Sonny at that Oklahoma World Championship was the meekest Palomino in the world at that moment. Why? If they had entered that competition, the horse ran away, jumped over a fence, ran down the street, never would have been in that show. You're a Christian. You and I say, we love Jesus. If we love Jesus, how meek are we to his commands? Aristotle said, blessed is the person who has every instinct and every impulse, every passion under control. And I ask myself, by that definition, I am not a meek person. I cannot be that. It's impossible. Every impulse, every instinct, every passion. And what did that philosophy say to the culture? It told the culture, I'm not virtuous. I have no virtue. Maybe Aristotle does. Maybe a couple of learned people, maybe. But you see, his definition and the cultural definition was that you had to be responsible to all of those qualities. Every instinct, every impulse, every passion under control. I go, no, I'm a sinner. There are things that I think and do that exclude me from that definition. It's impossible. And that's 
true about keeping the law. We cannot perfectly complete it. So Jesus comes along and he says, blessed is the person who has every instinct, every impulse, every passion under control. Blessed is the person who is completely God-controlled. He adds. That's why he would say, seek first the kingdom of God. And then all these other things will be granted to you. He's saying, what is it that you want? Do you want to hear the Lord? Do you want to obey the Lord? Do you want to be a virtuous person? Well, that's why Christ died. He died on the cross because you and I cannot be perfectly that virtuous person. He is the only one who lived a perfectly virtuous life. And we put our trust in him. And we recognize, I can't do this. But I know someone who did it, and I trust in him. I trust in his word. I trust his commandment. I trust when I feel that bit in my mouth that I'm not going to fight him. I'm not going to respond against the reins. I'm going to go with him. When he says to love your enemy, when he says put aside personal injury, when he says come corporately and worship, when he says go to other people and show the mercy and love of Christ, when he says those things, do I believe those things? Do I respond to him? And I have to say, as I look at the church universally in the United States and probably true around the world, uh, the church is a very sorry place right now. People are afraid. They're filled with anxiety. We don't want to shake hands. We don't want to say hello. We are frightened to death. There's another understanding that the culture had of this word. Blessed are the meek. Not only do they want to hear and obey the Lord and show justice and mercy and caring and thoughtfulness about other people, but the other understanding is that the meek person is not a know-it-all. If you're a teacher, you understand a student. You could be a great student if you already didn't know everything. See, the thing about life is that it's continually opening up new lessons. And we're learning, hopefully. Many people I know aren't learning a thing. It's just the same repetition. Haven't learned anything from this week, let alone last year, let alone 10 years ago. And so life is a great classroom. And God is teaching us continually. And so if you're seeking the kingdom of Christ, you are not the same person you were a year or 10 years ago. But a lot of people know it all. And so you can't teach them a thing. That's true of people who come to church, as well as people that we work with, as people we know in our families. 
What Jesus is saying is, blessed is the person who has the wisdom to understand their own ignorance, their own weakness, and our own need. Meekness has always been understood as I'm not who I can be. And thank God that there is a voice that I can listen to through the bit in my mouth. The things when I feel guilt or shame. What's God teaching me? He's saying, that's not helping you. There's another way. There's another route. But a lot of us get caught in the habit and just continue the same behavior. Are there any examples of someone who is meek? As a matter of fact, it's interesting we find that there is one person who we are told was the meekest man on earth. And who was that? Moses. Numbers 12, 3. The man Moses was very meek, more than all the men that were on the face of the earth. And so when the Pharaoh was told by most let my people go. Moses saw, I can't do that. I, I stutter. I'm weak. You got the wrong guy. And so there was a, a basic humility. Was he giving an excuse? Probably it's a mixture of both. God speaks to him at a bush, says, Go, go to Pharaoh. Set my people free. Many obstacles. He goes across the Red Sea, up Mount Sinai. God gives him the commandments. He leaves the people down below. He returns only to find that they have fashioned a calf and they're worshiping that calf. It only took a few minutes for them to change. <clears throat> In anger, he takes those tablets and he breaks them. Was that the right time for him to show his anger? I believe it was. He was meek. He knew the right time to show anger. But then there were other times that he should have let it pass. One of those incidents was when the people came to him and said, uh, we need water. Moses, in anger, took his staff and he struck the rock. We know later on that God did not want him to do that in anger. And that becomes the reason that he will not go into the promised land. So what do we learn? We learn that Moses is a man. He's not perfect. He showed anger at the right time, but he also showed it at the wrong time. And when you show it at the wrong time, what should we do? We should say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I was out of control. I was angry. It is not the time to say I was right. That only leads to more division and hurt. Eventually, Moses is exhausted. He's just a man. You and I are just men, women, boys, and girls. We're human. We will never live Aristotle's 
perfect, virtuous person, nor does Jesus expect that of us. But he does expect us to show anger at certain times. And one of the things that is outraging me right now is how passive the church of Jesus Christ is. How passive. We will stay like this forever. It's okay. It's not okay. We have learned some very bad habits over these last seven or eight months. Alexander the Great, considered one of the great warrior soldiers, courageous man, virtuous in his courage. But in Babylon, where he would eventually die, he came to that city and lamented, I have no other worlds to conquer. In a drunken feast in Babylon, of all places, in a raucous party, with what was called the Hercules cup. It was a large cup that was filled uh, with alcohol that no one could drink that amount of alcohol. Well, Alexander the Great, they say, drank the Hercules cup. The next day, he was on his deathbed. He was 33 years old. He was courageous. He led a mighty army. But he had no personal self-discipline. He recognized, I can never be that man, so I accept who I am. Jesus comes along and says, do not accept who you believe you are. I believe, says Jesus, that you are far more than you ever imagined. Jesus comes and says to you and me, you're far worse than you ever imagined. You're capable of dying by drink. You are capable of that. But you're also been created by me to live a virtuous life. You won't do it perfectly, but I am here so that you will have a fuller life. You're not stuck. The story is told that a man who was a soldier for Alexander the Great, had fallen asleep. He was on sentry. He was to guard the camp. They found him asleep. That was a death sentence. They brought him before Alexander, and they explained that this man is a coward. He fell asleep and left the camp threatened. Alexander had the man stand, and he said, uh, what is your name? And meekly, with his head down, the man said, my name is Alexander. What was that? What is your name? My name, sir, is Alexander. Alexander, you're standing before Alexander the Great. Alexander, either change your name or change your behavior. 
figures came out this week from the Pew Foundation. The Christian church in America lost 12% of its membership in the last 10 years. It's considered the fastest decline ever me measured in the Christian church in America. What's going to happen with this pandemic? It's going to escalate. There are people who are going to be afraid for quite a while. God will use this time for his purpose. So he causes one nation to rise, one to fall. But honestly, I'm not that concerned about a nation. I am concerned about people, individuals. How is it with you? You have the name Christian. How do you behave? Jesus came into this world that you and I would be made new. He says, I've come to transform your thinking. Are you thinking? Are you being changed? If not, then change your name. That is not what Christ does. When Christ comes into a life, he changes our changer. The things I used to want, I no longer want. The things I thought I would never want, I now want. What is it that you want? Do you want the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ? Or do you want your own kingdom? Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that blessed are the meek, Blessed are those who understand the right time to be angry and the right time to be passive. Blessed are those whose emotions are under God's control. Blessed are those who are not a know-it-all but instead that humbly we understand that you came into the world to save us from ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that you are good and gracious God, that by your grace, a free gift, you change us. You make us your sons and daughters. We thank you for Jesus Christ who died, who rose again, who will come one day, who is here right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together for the benediction. Jesus promised, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Go joyfully in the name of Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace. The Lord make his face to shine
and be gracious.